treating stimulant use disorder. And this was a slide deck that I had actually developed with a number with a team of people. Um, uh, so uh, my name is on here, but I also have to give some credit to Dr. Puri, Nick Galino, and Dr. DeVito, who um, have been uh, uh, thought partners. And there's an entire writing committee that ASAM has put together on a national practice guideline for treating stimulant use disorder. Um, I will uh, uh, share the link to that the to the current draft guideline. Um, the draft is headed towards the board for approval, uh, not this coming weekend, but the uh, weekend, I think, of the 21st in October. Um, so we'll go from the Wisconsin Society of Addiction Medicine annual meeting to the ASAM board meeting in D.C., where I'll, we'll approve a document, and then we will have a published uh, national practice guide on stimulant use disorder. Um, it would, uh, so, okay, uh, uh, now I have no financial conflicts of interest. I'm the president of ASAM and not unbiased with respect to ASAM. Um, I will be talking about medications today that can be used to treat stimulant use disorder. None of them are FDA approved for the indication of stimulant use disorder. There are actually no medications that are FDA approved for the indication of stimulant use disorder. Um, but there, uh, uh, the presentation will be, as they say, evidence-based. Uh, so we, I, I will be presenting the, um, thank you, Elizabeth, for putting that, the link. Um, so I will be uh, uh, talking about the evidence behind these medications. All right. So this is what, if you go to the link that Elizabeth put in, this is what it looks like, right? A draft guideline. It, this is what the page looks like, and then you actually have to click on the link and download the, the PDF guideline. The PDF guideline that has um, been posted and we received public comment around is outdated. That is not going to be the actual published guideline. It'll be similar, right? It's got similar domains, um, but it is actually a different, uh, uh, the, the, the actual recommendation statements did evolve in response to public comments. So let's talk about stimulants. Stimulants stimulate the release and inhibit the reuptake of dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. Um, cocaine works by blocking essentially the dopamine transporter primarily, and sort of secondarily, it has some uh, norepinephrine and serotonin effects, so it's mostly a dopaminergic reuptake inhibitor blocker. Methamphetamine, on the other hand, actually displaces vesicular dopamine. So what happens is um, somebody takes methamphetamine, the vesicular monamine transporter, which is the, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry to bore you with this, but I think it's important. The vesicular monamine transporter on the vesicles um, selectively reuptakes methamphetamine and it affects the gradient. So what happens is actually um, uh, 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 it ex sort of exchanges endogenous dopamine with methamphetamine. And so what happens there is now you've got this rise in intracellular dopamine. Those dopamine transporters that take dopamine from the synaptic cleft back into the presynaptic neuron, when the the, now the gradient changes. They're, they're not, um, what do you call them, uh, ATP powered, right? They are, they are, uh, uh, they work through what's called passive diffusion. So now all of a sudden you get this rush of dopamine out of the cytoplasm into the synaptic cleft. What does any of this mean? Cocaine works quickly and short. <laughs> it is a short acting, you know, you take cocaine, it lasts 20, 30 minutes. So people that use cocaine, use cocaine like several times an hour, right? And, and if they're using for hours, so, you know, many, many times over the course of an evening or use episode. Methamphetamine takes longer to really cause that uh, spike in it, uh, um, uh, cyto or the uh, synaptic dopamine. But when it does, that amplitude is tremendous because what it's doing is a reversing all of the machinery that gets dopamine out of the synapse and puts it back into the cell. It takes dopamine out of the cell and puts it into the synapse. So it lasts 12 to 15 hours hours, right? So they are like order of magnitude different in terms of their uh, uh, duration of action. And the cantheones are kind of in the middle. What's a cantheone? Uh, bath salts. Bath salts that have amphetamine type properties, they tend to last shorter amounts of time, but all, again, a fair amount of variability. This is a schematic of everything I just said. So I had asked, Brian, can we just treat Methamphetamine use disorder with Adderall, or uh, the generic name, dextroamphetamine amphetamine salts. And my answer is, well, and I'll get into some of the evidence on psychostimulants, but the short answer is um, the, uh, uh, the replacement treatments that seem to work really well for opioid use disorder, 
do not work nearly as well for stimulant use disorder, right? Buprenorphine and methadone have been FDA approved, well validated with tremendous evidence of increasing, of decreasing substance use, increasing tumor retention, increasing psychosocial stability and quality of life. I mean, it is a, like, it's it's one of the only tools that drop substance-related mortality about over fourfold, right? Buprenorphine and methadone. Life-saving medications when, when used appropriately. There is some modest evidence on the use of psychostimulants to treat stimulant use disorder, but it is nowhere near the same effect size in terms of, uh, of those same measures, treatment retention, reduction in use, increase in health and wellness, quality of life. Um, so we'll get into some medication strategies, but I just wanted to highlight the mechanism of action of stimulants is why treating stimulant use disorder is a bit tricky, particularly with medications, because the nice thing about opioids is there is the mu opioid receptor. And if you can find a, a, a molecule that binds to that, um, you have something that could work. Where are the targets for stimulant use disorder? The cyclic monomy transporter, dopamine transporter, um, uh, the dopamine receptor itself, and there's a number of subtypes of dopamine receptors. Um, uh, and the truth is these drugs work through mechanisms that don't lend themselves to, you know, easy pharmacologic fixes. So there are meds that can help, but they're not meds with the same effect size as we see with opioid use disorder. Because on the molecular level, stimulant use disorder really does work differently. Okay, so this is the without drug with cocaine and the blocked uh, uh, dopamine reuptake, and then um, the uh, amphetamine displacing uh, uh, intracellular dopamine, and then uh, dopamine actually going out of the dopamine transporter as opposed to in, which is the usual uh, course. All right. Um, here are some names of synthetic synth uh, stimulants. These are cantheones. So uh, methedrone, methylone, methylene deoxyproverolone, or MDPV, benzylparazone, or BZP. Um, uh, we, you know, I, I did my fellowship in New York and. Um, uh, but did most of medical school in LA. We do see bath salts, but it's not like this like huge wave of bath salts. Like we see bath salts, but they're sort of like they're 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 still I'll call them a minority player in parts of the world, you know, in, in parts of the world like New York where we saw them, but not not nearly the extent we saw cocaine or bath salts here in Los Angeles where we see bath salts, but not nearly the extent of which where we see methamphetamine. Now, what I've implied here, and actually before I go on to that slide, but what I've implied here is that if somebody uses a stimulant, then you get this rush of dopamine. And uh, many of you are probably aware, dopamine is what we call the final common pathway of the dopamine model of addiction. That is, dopamine triggers addictive behavior. So this implies that everybody that uses a stimulant is going to develop a stimulant use disorder. Well, here's a question. How many people that use cocaine at any point in their lives, then at some point in their lives, meet criteria for cocaine use disorders? Anyone know? And I regret this is the interactive part of the grand rounds. So I'm sorry I'm asking you questions. Is anyone, uh, the, the, there's actually a, a cohort study on this, NISARC, which looked at of people who use a drug, and it was a cohort study over time, so they could do lifetime, they could do mo lifetime uh, modeling. Um, what's the chance that somebody who's using cocaine is going to then have a cocaine use disorder at some point in their lives? Does anyone know? 15%? It's 20%, right? 15% might be closer to the point prevalence, right? Like of the people who use cocaine now, how many people have cocaine use disorder? But lifetime risks go up because that you extend that amount of time. So it's 20%. Yeah. With cannabis, it's 9%. With alcohol, it's 23%. With tobacco, it's two thirds. Um, one of the things, now, uh, when this study, NISARC was running, um, it was kind of pre-huge flooding the system with prescription opioids, right? So we don't have NISARC data to model the current opioid use disorder. But the chance of, of developing an opioid use disorder after a response to opioids is anywhere between 3 and maybe 30%. It depends on the, per it depends on the study and depends on the person. Now, if you look at past month use, the numbers get a little more interesting. So this is national data. And if you look at past, uh, sorry, this is past year use 
of, uh, not sorry, I meant past year. Past year use of cocaine, prescription stimulants, and methamphetamine. Cocaine remains um, the number one used stimulant in the United States, followed by misuse of prescription stimulants. To be clear, this is non-medical use, somebody that take more than prescribed or took their friends, but you know, this is people reporting using stimulants in a way that wasn't like prescribed for them. And then methamphetamine. So uh, 4.8 million Americans, 3.7 million Americans, 2.5. Now, this is the VEN. How many people had cocaine use only, prescription stimulant use only, methamphetamine use only versus methamphetamine and prescription stimulants, which is a subset. So this is the model of the roughly a little, a little over 9 million people with past year uh, stimulant misuse of the category. So cocaine, prescription stimulants, and methamphetamine. Although I live in California where methamphetamine is absolutely by far the dominant stimulant people are using. Like, unquestionably, uh, uh, our emergency rooms are full of people with stimulant use disorder. So how many people had a past year use disorder? Interestingly, although methamphetamine is the minority player, um, methamphetamine has the highest rate of use disorder. So we don't have knee start data on this, but methamphetamine is very addictive. <laughs> very addictive. Uh, uh, upwards of 50% uh, if we're looking at the, if, if we're looking at past year use and then past year criteria for use disorder. Um, it's the majority of people that use methamphetamine that have uh, methamphetamine use disorder. So the point is, set and setting really do matter. And the legal status of drugs really do matter, right? Uh, how legal and promoted a drug is increases its uh, addictivity. So within this context, we're the worst overdose crisis in American history. Um, I have not looked in the numbers in Wisconsin, but I presume uh, the numbers in California look way worse than even this. This is 2016, we've been on this like over threefold increase in um, uh, overdose deaths. Nationally, uh, uh, overdose deaths um, on the East Coast had sort of seen that kind of explosion a decade earlier. Um, and so the, the national data is a little smoother, but still you know, increasing. We're in the worst overdose crisis in history. So what do we do with, with uh, uh, you know, the worst overdose crisis in history? I'll get into treatment, but before I get into treatment, the stimulant use disorder national practice guideline, the way that it's structured, talks about um, stabilization, because a lot of people don't come to say a treatment program saying, I'm ready for treatment for stimulant disorder. They land in the emergency department with stimulant induced psychosis. They land in the hospital with a uh, stimulant induced stroke or heart attack, right? And so the first part of the national practice guideline talks a lot about stabilization. Now the national practice guideline, and so you can imagine, okay, <laughs> uh, what is the cardiac workup? What is the, you know, the, the other medical workup for the, 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 the psychiatric workup for people with stimulant psychosis? Um, we decided when we wrote this, uh, the National Practice Guideline to not recreate like um, agitation management or, you know, or antipsychotic management or you know, how to do a cardiac workup with people with chest pain or, you know, stroke prophylaxis. We refer to existing practice standard. So one practice standard on man uh, the management of agitation is, um, uh, to use the least restrictive uh, agitation management possible, so oftentimes a quiet room with destimulation. When me medications are needed, um, benzodiazepines are a treatment of choice for just regular agitation. But when psychotic symptoms are present, hallucinations, delusions, or like I'll call it grossly disorganized thinking. I don't mean delirium, but I mean like grossly disorganized theory, uh, 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 thinking, um, then uh, antipsychotics are indicated. And this, uh, in the, uh, I say this as a psychiatrist, um, whether I can use antipsychotics to treat stimulant induced psychosis is actually been a question among general psychiatrists, right? Because many general psychiatrists, particularly, and I make no, no shade when I say this, older psychiatrists used to tell people, oh, go get treatment for your stimulant use disorder. Then if you still have psychosis, come back and talk to me, but I'm not gonna treat you for a psychotic condition, if that's not what you have, if or you know uh, a non-substance related psychotic condition such as schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder, psychotic features, psychotic depression, et cetera, right? Um, but uh, you know, if I don't have clarity that that's what I'm treating, I won't treat. And it can do patients a tremendous disservice because the truth is, stimulant-induced psychosis does respond to antipsychotics. What's different is unlike other conditions where patients might end up on standing on a psychotics long term, 
I treat patients and the, the, there's you know, an evidence around treating patients with stimulant-induced psychosis with time-limited antipsychotics, right? So it's kind of like, how long do I treat with Tylenol? How, do I treat, how long do I treat your, your fever with Tylenol? Um, <laughs> you know, as long as you have the fever, right? But Tylenol doesn't treat the underlying cause of fever, right? If the underlying cause is uh, uh, inflammation, infection, uh, you know, there's a bunch of conditions that cause fever, right? Uh, then that would be what I would also want to target treatment to while reducing the symptoms. So antipsychotics reduce the symptom. They don't actually um, uh, treat the underlying use disorder. And they have been studied, right? There's a theory that, well, if I treat with a dopamine blocker, will it make stimulants less rewarding? And if stimulants are less rewarding, will people use less? This sort of like antagonistic model. And the answer is absolutely not. Antipsychotics made no difference to people's use of stimulants, the severity of their stimulant use disorder. Um, it just reduces uh, psychotic features. And not everyone who uses stimulants gets psychosis. Um, so that's, we have pages and pages and pages of, uh, you know, guidelines on everything from management of cardiac stability with calcium channel blockers versus not, uh, uh, nitrates versus not. Uh, we, we have a wonderful toxicologist. Uh, and you can read the draft guideline to get a sense of like how in the, in, in the weeds around um, acute care management of stimulant use disorder we have. But one final common, you know, recommendation statement is anybody who uses stimulants um, should be offered stimulant use disorder treatment. So that's where I'm going to focus most of this talk. I know I've like talked through some stuff, but most of what I'm going to talk about next is how do you actually treat stimulant use disorder? But just to be clear, the National Practice Guidelines have a lot of other components not specific to treating stimulant you know, use disorder, but around treating the sequela of stimulant use disorder. And one other thing I'll mention, the um, uh, guideline has a whole set of recommendation statements about something called harm reduction. So not everybody who uses stimulants wants to change the way that they use stimulants. And interestingly, you can treat stimulant use disorder even with people who aren't interested in cessation because it can help them reduce their stimulant use. So none of the treatments I'm talking about are predicated upon the patients like, um, how do I put this? Uh, uh, the, you don't hold them until the patient is stopped, right? You, you can start the move that the patient's still using as long as the patient's on board with participating in the treatment. Um, uh, so the harm reduction recommendation statements um, reference things like everybody who has a stimulant use disorder should be uh, uh, provided naloxone, either through prescription or through distribution, but, you know, naloxone to reverse overdose. Um, uh, and why? Because, you know, naloxone doesn't actually... Uh, do anything dopaminergic, right? It doesn't actually touch anything related to stimulants. It's the increasing presence of high potency synthetic opioids like fentanyl in the stimulant supply. So we're seeing numbers like 5% of the methamphetamine now has, um, which would be one in every 20 doses uh, of, of stimulants that are taken now have fentanyl in it, um, which is again a non trivial amount of fentanyl that if somebody does not have opioid tolerance could be the difference between them living or not. So everybody gets naloxone is like one key message when I give talks, everybody should get naloxone. Second uh, component around harm reduction. If somebody is going to use, um, they should be uh, provided with uh, safer use supplies. So people that inject should be provided with uh, clean injected equipment so they don't share equipment and spread infectious disease. People who smoke should not be, uh, should be provided with, uh, uh, um, uh, smoking supplies, uh, because smoking is essentially virtually universally more safe than injecting in terms of like uh, the full set of health risks. And so when you give people smoking supplies, that actually has been shown to decrease injecting behavior, which is itself health benefits. There's all these harm reduction strategies that we can engage. And the last thing um, around harm reduction is uh, also, I guess, related to the medical workup, which is people with risk factors should be, you know, tested for a set of infectious diseases. Those infectious diseases should be treated, you know, in an integrated way in the context of healthcare people are getting. So that's, I just, th those recommendation statements are there. I did not, um, they, they weren't final, final. And so I haven't like put them up on the slides, but I just want to sort of speak to them. Like, the, the, you know, you can look to the guideline for a set of recommendations around like assessment, diagnosis, stabilization, and specifically harm reduction for people that might not be interested in doing treatment. So what is the treatment for stimulant use disorder? It's medications, counseling, and support. What is the treatment for opioid use disorder? Medications, counseling, and support. What is the treatment for diabetes? meds, diet, and exercise. What is the treatment 
for depression, meds, counseling, support. The treatment of symptom disorder is actually not fundamentally different than how we treat most other chronic illnesses. Right? It's, it's just it's not fundamentally different. The ingredients are different, right? We use different meds for different conditions, right? Insulin does not treat methamphetamine use disorder. You know, uh, uh, mirtazapine doesn't necessarily treat diabetes, right? You know, like the 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 the, the actual fundament, the details are different, but the domains are very similar. And the reason I bring this up is, um, I, I in the field. Uh, I work with people and they, there's a fair amount of intimidation. Oh, goodness, this person has a use disorder. I, you know, this is this is out of my scope. I'm out of my I'm out of my depth here. I don't know what to do. And I would remind like we treat all kinds of conditions with the types of treatments that we offer patients for all kinds of things. So talking to people about their substance use um, and offering within the you know scope of what we have available meds, some focus counseling support, and then linkage if somebody needs a higher level of care is not that different than what we do for any other medical condition. And uh, it oftentimes works well when you have an interdisciplinary team that uh, has expertise on treating behavioral health conditions. So um, there is a SAMHSA evidence-based guideline treatment of stimulant use disorder. Um, the uh, evidence to decision tables that our writing committee used for the stimulant use disorder uh, guideline um, I looked at this. We also then looked at a whole bunch of literature that sort of underscores this. But um, uh, the each of the treatments mentioned here are um, uh, treatments we emphasized. And we made, when we wrote the stimulant use disorder guideline, made a particular point to emphasize one of these treatments, which is contingency management. It's the second bullet down. So I'm going to spend a lot of my time today talking about contingency management because it works really well. When I say it works really well, um, contingency management works well for stimulant use disorder. And interestingly, most substance use disorders respond to contingency management. It's not specific to stimulant use disorder. But for other substance use disorders, for example, for alcohol use disorder, we have decently effective meds. For opioid use disorder, very effective meds. And for, for tobacco use disorder, somewhere in the middle, right? Like pretty good meds, right? They're good, they're, they're decent, they're, they're helpful. And so we've got other strategies that, that we use um, with meds and with, with counseling. Um, and contingency management has been historically stymied by anti-kickback statutes that, you know, because what is a, a contingency management? It is fundamentally providing somebody with a substance use disorder an incentive when they uh, demonstrate a desired behavior. That is, that is CM in a nutshell. And then incentive. You're giving somebody something. If that something is monetary, people feel weird. Well, wait a minute, am I paying this person? Am I paying this person to come to treatment? If so, is this an inducement? Am I running a foul of ethics rules, right? There's all these sort of like questions that come up and that's really delayed the adoption of what is a really effective treatment in, to treat stimulant use disorder, which again, um, we don't have a lot of other super effective alternatives in terms of like big effect sizes. We've got a lot of options, but in terms of like what's the effect size, CM for stimulant use disorder has some of the biggest effect sizes compared to the alternatives. So what, what are the alternative psychosocial treatments? Motivational interviewing, community reinforcement approach, and cognitive behavioral therapy all have a well-demonstrated evidence base for stimulant use disorder. This is the SAMHSA evidence review. Um, the evidence review within the stimulant use disorder guideline, well, we have separate evidence decision tables that are posted if you ever wanna look, look at them. That goes, it, it's a bit more detailed. Um, but in this evidence review, there's strong evidence for MI, not, not, that's not a heart attack, that's motivational interviewing, uh, CM, continuing management, CRA, and uh, uh, CBT. Um, they all can be used in non-residential settings, or outpatient healthcare settings. They also can be used in inpatient, so residential and hospital settings. Um, there is specific training available for all. And um, at the time that SAMHSA published this, there wasn't really a CM training module. There is now, right? Uh, and I, I give, um, I guess this could be a conflict of interest. I have to give credit to the my colleagues at UCLA Integrated Substance Abuse Programs that have a uh, online available CM program uh, that's tied to uh, something we've been able to do here in California, which is Medicaid funded contingency management using federal funding through CMS using a waiver to pay for recovery incentives, which according to a protocol, which I'm happy that, and UCLA is doing all the training and technical assistance and organizational readiness and getting the treatment system ready to go. Um, okay, uh, so contingency management. The basic assumption 
of contingency management is substance use can be reduced using operant conditioning. Now, I say reduced, it could be changed as well, all right? So changed might mean somebody's not gonna use less, but they might use differently. They go from smoking, from injecting to smoking could be an example of a positive change. So substance use can be, you know, changed using operant conditioning. CM is associated with improving treatment retention and adherence. And the classic version of CM, which I'm gonna talk about today, is where um, the outcome is toxicology verified abstinence from stimulants. So the classic model of CM is people who are interested in stopping their use of stimulants, right? They come into a treatment program, they're using stimulants, they would like to not be using stimulants, and this is, this is a tool that they can use to help support that abstinence. Um, a few key things about contingency management. The behavior has to be able to be objectively measured. That is, somebody saying, I used less stimulants, is not an objective measurement. It's a patient statement. An objective measure is urine toxicology verified absence from stimulants. The behavior to be modified must be monitored frequently. Standard CM programs are twice a week. And one of the reasons for this is um, cocaine, or benzococaine, which is the metabolite of cocaine that's tested, um, is usually out of your system in like two days. Right. So if you're only testing somebody one, once a week, you're missing roughly five days a week of time uh, with, with standard toxicology testing. Similar with uh, amphetamines and methamphetamine, they're quickly metabolized. They're usually out of your system in maybe two or three days. So twice a week gives you a much better chance of having, I'll call it time coverage around toxicology testing than not. Um, so monitor frequently. And, and this is the key. The, re, the enforcement, the incentive has to be immediate. So it will not work to like, Somebody provides a urine, you send it to the lab, and then three days later, they get the incentive. That's that 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 you've now um, uncoupled the objectively measured behavior, urine verified, you know, urine toxicology verified simulant abstinence from the incentive. The key is that it, it's got to be paired, right? It's got to be as close to like the immediate reward as, as possible. And for unsuccessful behavior, a positive urine drug screen means you're withholding the reinforcer. And this is also why, if you ever run a CM program, it is much better to have a CM coordinator who is not the patient's clinician or psychotherapist or practitioner or the person providing care. Why? Because when I'm treating somebody and I'm the one, uh, uh, pro you know, providing counseling and skills and strategies and medication management, I'm rooting for somebody. I'm rooting for them. The patient comes in, doc. It was great. I used so much less this week than I used last week. If you in a cup, you're in drug street, it's positive. So as a part of these clinician, I want to celebrate somebody's statements around success. But the cup says positive. So a good CM program has a CM coordinator that is truly, it's almost like a machine. <laughs> Urine's negative, incentive. Urine's positive, no incentive. That's uncoupled from the like, clinician that's in the weeds and, you know, like really rooting for somebody. Um, and actually there are some now apps that will do CM um, because, uh, uh, you know, that, that kind of uh, automation is possible um, if you can set up all the technology for it. Uh, and it really should be like based on whatever your objective measure of success is um, becomes then tied to the incentive. Um, all right. Uh, now urine negative uh, uh, urine toxicology verified stimulant absence is not the only possible target for all CM in general. So applications of CM could be everything from you get an incentive if you come to counseling um, around uh, substance use or not, you know, not using substances or not using certain stimulants, substances. Reinforcement could include money. Cash is remarkably effective. Cash also makes regulators like me very nervous so uh, oftentimes vouchers are used instead because vouchers have a more narrow um, possibility of how you can spend them and then privileges so if you've ever worked in opioid treatment programs or uh, places that that um, dispense methadone to people um, as people attend counseling and provide uh, urine that is negative for stimulants oftentimes um, 
uh, they get more take-home doses, right? So that's like a built-in, it's not a financial incentive, but it, it's, a, it's a type of incentive. And there was, uh, I think a comment, and I, I cut out a quarter of my eye, so I might miss it. Um, what about medication adherence? Absolutely, right? If I call the pharmacy, you picked up your meds, then you get the incentive. Or if, you know, I check with the, um, uh, your housing manager around, you know, you're going to the med window if somebody's in permanent supportive housing that has a med window. If I can verify your adherence that way, then you get an incentive. Or, um, hey, every time a week goes by where you don't get, or I don't get a report of you causing a disruption in your housing, um, you know, and actually we're uh, right now working on a Hilton Foundation funded CM uh, pilot that just lists that can use an incentive to help people keep their housing. It's not related to substance use, right? It's not like somebody can still use drugs, but the outcome is uh, uh, um, housing manager verified abstinence of behavioral, like, <laughs> you know, uh, 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 behavioral issues to help keep people engaged in permanent support of housing. So the point is the applications of CM are, are broad and it's not just money, right? Privileges like take home doses are uh, uh, an incentive because that means fewer visits to the, to the OTP. Um, in uh, residential settings, it could be um, everything from access to game rooms, access to, you know, um, other desired things uh, uh, within the um, uh, within the residential site are all reasonable areas of focus for CM. Um, now, you might say, okay, well, if we did cash or vouchers, I can't afford uh, to, you know, pay hundreds of dollars uh, for, for these incentives. So this is Nancy Petrie, who um, I had the fortune of meeting and uh, is, is, is no longer with us. She, uh, she passed away. But Nancy um, published a lot on what's called the fishbowl method, which is an intermittent reinforcer. If any of you have ever played the lottery, you'll know what an intermittent reinforcer is, which is um, most lottery tickets have no value. A few of them you get like a couple of like a dollar or two back. And then like, you know, rarely you get, you know, hundreds, thousands, or the, you know, big, big payoffs, which are very rare events. So what a fishbowl is, is about half the tickets in a fishbowl, um, I, I say like have an affirmation, but are not associated with any particular value. The other half, like the, you know, 80% of the other half are like worth a dollar, then some, yeah, a very small number of five, and there's like a $100 like incentive. And it doesn't just have to be cash. It could be uh, a prize. It could be a privilege. You know, there, there, there's a variety of ways to do it. And the incentive is actually the draw from the bowl, the chance. And so oftentimes in the fishbowl method, as weeks go on, people get building reinforcement. So the first week, the first, the first test that week, you get one draw. Then later that week, the second, you know, uh, um, CM visit, you get two draws. The third CM visit, you get three draws. And so your chances of getting um, uh, uh, the reinforcement go up. California CM program is a fixed benefit. That is, if you uh, you have urine negative for stimulants, um, you get a, a fixed incentive. It starts at twelve dollars and fifty cents and goes up. Uh, if you uh, hit every mark and you you know get the incentive throughout the entire twenty four month period, it adds up to five hundred ninety nine dollars, which is just under the amount that the state of California or the federal government will allow being paid without a ten ninety nine. So taxes turn out to be the upper limit of uh, of that. CMS approved it, and although it is well over the OIG's safe harbor for CM programs, which was historically $15 an incentive and $75 per year, um, uh, th those incentives were not nearly enough, right? Like, those weren't clinically effective dollar amounts. So um, uh, there is now precedent, and the VA has a long history of giving clinically effective contingency management amounts. And so this is half slip or winners. Uh, the win frequency inversely related to cost is how a community health center could keep cost downs using the fishbowl method. But this is what the evidence is. Voucher incentives for cocaine use disorder. Behavioral is, and this is the percentage of substance uh, of subjects who are negative for cocaine. Um, so you got between, you know, 50 to 80% per week, <laughs> um, you know, you, you sort of see the range there, um, who are receiving the behavioral treatment, that's the CM treatment, versus standard treatment, which is kind of counseling. So it is not a subtle difference. Um, and this has been known for what, three decades. This article is from 94. Uh, so this is not a new treatment. Um, uh, so CM reduces methamphetamine and cocaine use. The longer intertest intervals that allow use to go undetect uh, undetected compromise the CM reinforcement of abstinence. Um, the longer, the better. So four months, uh, there, there are some four-month studies and six-month studies. Um, 
the four month four month studies are better than two month studies are better than one month studies. Um, but you, it has to be at least four weeks. CM for less than four weeks doesn't appear to be all that effective. And uh, this is essentially the graphs from that same article uh, uh, looking at duration of effects of CM, showing that the four month um, uh, uh, program led to more days of abstinence after the program ended. So um, one question is asked, okay, let's say you do CM, substance use goes down, but when CM ends, how durable is that? And the answer is, well, if the program is four more months, it's more durable, uh, uh, the, the, the durability goes up. And the other thing is, if you sort of think about it, what CM does is teach people, it gives people an incentive, a direct incentive to not use. And while you're not using, you're picking up skills and strategies to not use. So really the question is how long does CM need to last for somebody in order for those skills and strategies and like not using stimulants stick? And that, as you can imagine, is pretty variable per person. So, you know, I, I, I have, a, you know, I have a dream that one day we'd be able to individualize treatment duration. Some people get CM for longer, some for shorter, again, depending on how, how the progress somebody's making. Um, but clinical trials are all fixed length. Um, there's a 22% likelihood of ongoing abstinence uh, studied over 24 weeks after the reinforcement ended versus comparison treatments. Again, longer reinforcement duration is longer duration of abstinence after reinforcement ends. And it um, does not appear to be a, a treatment that uh, whose effectiveness changes based on age, race, or gender, right? So there's no difference between male and females, um, white, black, Asian, uh, Latin, uh, or Latino, or uh, Native American, uh, Alaskan Native, or indigenous people populations. And it seems to work well for young, and, young uh, uh, adult, and uh, older populations. So that's CM in a nutshell. The stimulant use disorder and actual practice guideline emphasizes CM as a standard of care for stimulant use disorder. So our hope is that then uh, gets models like California's uh, Medicaid-funded CM model kind of adopted. Um, a few other psychotherapies that are worth mentioning is CBT. Um, patients are, become trained to evaluate uh, distortions in thinking actions and uh, distorted feelings. Um, and then uh, there are a whole bunch of skills that you um, learn over the course of a CBT uh, a treatment. Uh, standard CBT sessions last about 50 minutes and uh, the period lasts anywhere between five and 10 months, kind of depending on the complexity of um, where somebody's coming from. But it does seem to help people reduce their stimulant use. The community reinforcement approach is sort of interesting. It starts with a functional analysis of substance use. What's good, what isn't good, kind of classical decisional balance. Then uh, relationship counseling. Who are the people in your life and the places and things you do, right? People, places, and things being the classic external triggers for, for use. Um, it focuses on vocational guidance and job skills so that people can get into the workforce as expeditiously as possible. Therapy focused on building social and drug refusal skills and building new non-use activities to help support somebody. So it's this sort of like, um, you know, functional analysis, substance use, uh, counseling focused on people, places, and things, getting people back to work, uh, getting people uh, uh, to be able to navigate the world without using and uh, building uh, recreational activities and social skills that they enjoy. And then lastly, motivational interviewing. I have a conflict of interest here. I uh, teach ASAM's motivational interviewing workshop, including the workshop we gave yesterday. So, you know, conflict of interest when I talk about this, but um, it does, uh, uh, the principle of uh, motivational interviewing is that many people who use drugs are ambivalent about it or actually most behaviors, right? Many people are ambivalent about everything from, you know, being overweight or not exercising or the amount of sleep they get, or there's a whole bunch of health behaviors. And motivation and being structures conversations that selectively reinforce something called change talk, right? You're listening for somebody's desirability, reasons, need, and readiness to be able to make positive change. Um, and uh, the clinician or the interviewer selectively responds to change talk. Um, the, you could have one session of motivational interviewing, you can have decades of sessions of motivational interviewing, but what they really do is to help structure a conversation in such a way where the patient gives voice to their ideas, values, and intentions to change. What motivational interviewing does not is get somebody to um, provide change talk when they're not ready to change, right? So if somebody's committed to not changing, motivational interviewing doesn't make anybody change. Um, and it can be done without any particular prescribed time period. 
Uh, these are the strategies, which is open-ended questions, reflections, asking permission before giving advice, evoking the patient's ideas, values, and plans, reinforcing change, talk, and partnership and acceptance. So uh, I'm going to conclude with uh, some of the medications for stimulant use disorder. And on this point, um, I'm going to be talking about medications for stimulant use disorder that are not the psychostimulants. And then I will mention, I will mention the psychostimulants that can be used to treat methamphetamine and cocaine use disorder with some caveated language that you'll uh, read in the uh, published version of the National Practice Guideline that ASAM is putting out on the treatment of stimulant use disorder. So um, here are the medications that seem to be clinically effective for methamphetamine use disorder, none of which are FDA approved to treat methamphetamine use disorder. Let me be clear, methamphetamine use disorder. It is a separate set of meds for cocaine use disorder. So for methamphetamine use disorder, we have extended release naltrexone, mirtazapine, propion, topiramate, and naltrexone. Um, there is one small study on dextroamphetamine, and there is an evidence base on methylphenidate, right? Those are the, the, the two psychostimulants that have an evidence base for methamphetamine use disorder. There's not a ton of trials, and um, the trials of psychostimulants Oh, there are actually, uh, there's a bunch of trials, but the trials on psychostimulants do suggest that um, higher doses are needed in people with stimulant use disorder. For cocaine use disorder, um, the National Practice Guideline does not mention sertraline. I only include it here because there is one study of sertraline to treat cocaine use disorder, and it seems to work in patients with depression, which tells me that sertraline treats depression, and people who have treated depression use cocaine less than people with untreated depression. So, so sertraline is not really a treatment for cocaine use disorder. It's a depression treatment, but that can help people with cocaine use disorder. We have topiramate and modafinil. And interestingly with modafinil, the only, um, the only cha change of cocaine use are people who used cocaine without alcohol. They did not have an alcohol use disorder. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's what the evidence says, is modafinil can treat cocaine use disorder in the subset of people that do not have an alcohol use disorder. And then there's positive trials on methamphetamine sustained release, which you can imagine is tricky. Uh, a combination of mixamphetamine salts and topiramate. Um, mixamphetamine salts on their own, particularly if uh, the person has ADHD, and dextroamphetamine sustained release. So I'm going to go through some of the trials of the non-stimulants just to give you a sense of what the effect size is. So um, this is a relatively recent, January 2021 Trevetti trial um, that uh, was published in New England Journal. Um, and it was uh, naltrexone extended release injectable plus maximum dose bupropion. So, uh, you know, 380 milligrams of naltrexone, and their protocol had it injected every three weeks. There was a previous trial to this, the ADAP1 trial, which was injected every four weeks, which was also a positive trial. Um, so, does naltrexone need to be dosed? Need to be dosed every three weeks to treat a methamphetamine use disorder? No. But when you dose it every three weeks as opposed to every four, the blood level stays higher, and that's there is a study supporting that. So getting insurance to pay for every three week extended release naltrexone injection is itself its own little uh, thing to navigate. But there again, there's this uh, now literature precedent for it. Um, now not everyone can tolerate bupropion 450. So what they did in the trial is when people were having insomnia, jitters, tremor, right, some of the activated effects of bupropion, they would back off and then always encouraged to raise the dose. So almost every patient got back up to 450, um, but not everyone was titrated there exactly on day three. So uh, the evidence was 13.6 of patients who were treated with extended release naltrexone plus bupropion were responders. I'll tell you what a responder is in a moment, versus 2.5% of placebo, which is pretty good, right? Uh, compared to people with an inactive treatment. A response counted as a methamphetamine urine, uh, uh, methamphetamine urine sample negative during the last two weeks of the trial. They were doing twice a week urine testing. And three of the four urines should be negative to be a responder. So their outcome, interestingly, was not pure methamphetamine abstinence. It was, you know, much less methamphetamine use, right? 75% of the urine samples were, were negative, but it wasn't you know, full methamphetamine abstinence. This is what the graph of the um, percentage of participants with the response. This is what it was different. There were two stages of the trial. It was a crossover design. I won't sort of get into the full study design other than to say the weighted average between the treated group and the placebo group, you can see the difference. So a placebo controlled trial with a statistically significant positive result. I will also say 13.6 is not 
every, you know, it's the got a number needed to treat and, you know, uh, <laughs> in sort of the, the, the eight, nine ish range, right? Uh, which means that most people treated with this do not, are not responders. That is, they don't stop their use of methamphetamine. My own clinical experience with this medication combination is people use methamphetamine less, but they don't necessarily stop unless they're doing a CM program, right? Unless I'm, I'm building other treatments. So we have meds and I don't get key, like if a patient won't do any other treatment and they just want meds, I'll treat them with this medication combination. Um, but just to be clear, uh, uh, it's not necessarily this blockbuster with a number needed to treat of like one or two, which is, you know, the numbers you see with medication, with uh, methadone and, and buprenorphine. Um, here's the, uh, uh, you can sort of see the design from week one to week 16 over the course of the trial and the crossover from stage one to stage two. All right. So that's extended release naltrexone and bupropion. Mirtazapine. So there's two small studies on mirtazapine. Both were done in San Francisco. Both were on uh, transgender women and cisgender men who had sex with men. Um, they were relatively small trials uh, that showed um, uh, uh, methamphetamine, there were more methamphetamine negative urines um, uh, compared to placebo. Um, again, the responses weren't like, it wasn't this like blockbuster response, but it was, you know, of 100, there will be 14 fewer individuals who test positive for methamphetamine at 12 weeks per 100 individuals receiving mirtazapine compared to placebo. It did not uh, improve treatment retention. Um, and what one of the things that was really interesting was, and most people didn't really adhere to mirtazapine. <laughs> like the mirtazapine adherence was like 28% of doses were taken. So like, you know, and if you ask people, did you take your meds, you know, went up a bit, right? By self-report to, you know, about 40%, but either way, right? Most doses weren't taken and yet it still seemed to have a response. Um, the end of this trial is in the, like, it's less than 100 in each, so it's a relatively small trial, relatively, you know, it's a specific population, a specific geography. I think we're still waiting to see how well would this generalize. That said, for patients that I have that can't take uh, uh, bupropion, they have seizure disorders or whatever, um, mirtazapine is something that, uh, and if they have insomnia and depression, I'll use mirtazapine, right? There, there's an evidence basis for it. Um, and this gives you kind of how close this is. This is uh, a Coffin and Colfax's study from 2011, 2019. Um, and uh, uh, you see the, um, you know, the N was what, like 65 and 68 people, uh, you know, like, uh, so relatively small. Man. Topiramate. So topiramate, uh, dosed, you usually start low at 25 and then work your way up to 200 uh, at bedtime. Um, does seem to help people reduce their methamphetamine use uh, with respect to placebo, although it's reduced use, not uh, cessation of methamphetamine. Uh, just a quick note, topiramate is teratogenic, so don't neglect contraceptives. Um, and you'll see the kind of slight difference in the placebo versus the topiramate trend line. Again, this is a trend towards positivity, but it's not, it's sort of reduced methamphetamine use, not abstinence. Um, there is a uh, similar literature on topiramate for cocaine use disorder. Um, again, it is it does achieve statistical significance on continuous abstinence, um, you know, but modestly, right? It's not this like yeah, a huge N drug and then a uh, uh, huge, huge effect size drug. And then modafinil for cocaine use disorder, there's a whole bunch of studies on this, as you can sort of see. Um, and uh, some of it, it, you can see it's also sort of a mixed trial, but if you look at that one line, right, um, which is the, uh, or the risk ratio, um, you'll see that uh, modafinil overall across a meta-analysis does not separate from one entirely, um, but does appear to work best in cocaine, uh, people who use cocaine without an alcohol use disorder. So here are my receipts if you want to look up the you know, uh, and I'll, I'll have to send this to you if you want to look up um, the literature that went into this. And uh, we will also have the evidence decision tables posted on, um, on the ASAM site for the forthcoming Simon use disorder national practice guideline. And what I'll leave you with is the psychostimulants for Simon use disorder. I cannot emphasize enough how different they are than agonist treatments for opioid use disorder. The idea is the same. The actual chemistry of these medications is different. So ASAM's national practice guideline is gonna say, um, psychostimulants can be considered to treat stimulant use disorder, but um, they should really only be managed by addiction medicine specialists 
or by clinicians that have uh, specialized training or supervision from uh, addiction physician specialists that uh, so people really know what they're doing because they are non-trivial in terms of their risk benefit profile and you would want to make sure that the uh, substantial risks of the medications are outweighed by the benefits.